Spread the word of Islam Oh, fortunate one Paradise must be won Paradise must be won Each day and each night Through darkness and through light Cry it out to the world Spread the word Spread the word of Islam. Inna alhamdulillah, nahmadahu wa nasta'inahu wa nasta'ghfir wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina. Man yahdihi allahu falamudhilla lah wa ma'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina. Man yahdihi allahu falamudhilla lah wa ma'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina. Man yahdihi allahu falamudhilla lah wa ma'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina. وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ We begin by praising Allah, we praise Him, we seek His help and we ask for His forgiveness. Whomsoever Allah guides, no one can misguide. And whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray, no one can guide. And I bear witness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone is worthy of worship. And that Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, is the last and final messenger of Allah. Today we have with us Sheikh and Professor An Najjar our esteemed guest. The Sheikh has published and written over a hundred books on a range of different topics. Some of his most famous works include an encyclopedia of over of ten volumes dealing with scientific miracles in the Quran. His works have been translated in a range of different languages including English, French, German, Spanish, Kurdish and even Chinese. The Sheikh has lectured and taught in many universities across the world. We are pleased to welcome Sheikh and Professor An Najjar. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you today, Sheikh? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Sheikh, today we'd like to know more about yourself, more about the professor behind the scenes, the Sheikh behind the scenes. We would like you to tell us a brief background of yourself, how you're brought up, your family life, and things like this, please, Sheikh. I begin by praising Allah, all glory be to Him, our Creator the creator of the universe and everything that's in it and by greeting you and our observers in our Islamic way Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh May Allah's peace, blessings and mercy be with you all um, I was born in 1933 in Egypt in the central part of the Delta uh, in a small village uh, I was born in a Muslim family that was committed to Islam by the grace of Allah. Uh, my grandfather was the scholar of the region, and my father was in the educational field, and all my uncles on both my father's side and my mother's side were uh, educated in Al-Azhar or in Dar al-Ulum, which are both two of the great Islamic institutions in Egypt. And we used to have uh, really many Islamic discussions in the house and um, at that time the missionary work in Egypt was at a climax and there was an American hospital in Tanta which is the capital of the county uh, where I, I belong and uh, this uh, American hospital was mainly a missionary work uh, all the doctors and the administrators and the nurses were working for trying to christen Muslims. And uh, my father and my grandfather, may Allah bless their souls both, were chasing them, uh, rebutting what they were saying and answering their queries and uh, trying to defend Islam. So really at a very early age, I came to be aware of the fact that Islam is the only form of divine guidance to man that has been kept intact in exactly the same language of revelation, the Arabic language, preserved by the will of Allah, word to word and letter to letter, while all other isms of the time are actually distorted versions of the original Islam that was taught to Adam on the moment of his creation and was revealed to a long chain of prophets and messengers and was finally integrated in the message of Muhammad, peace be upon him. And I was aware. dialogue with a non-Muslim or a trialogue or any discussion. Uh, so this training came to us 
uh, at a very early age. And uh, at that time, the Egyptian villages were uh, more committed to Islam than today, really. We had the Islamic uh, school, or the, what they call the madrasa, or the kutab, where all the children of the village used to go and memorize Quran and perfect mathematics, uh, or arithmetic at least at an early stage, can know how to read and write. Uh, during the month of Ramadan, we used to have a, a, really a study uh, uh, sitting in the house uh, after Salatul Taraweeh, which comes after Aisha prayer. Uh, we used to gather in the house all the intellectuals in the village um, from different backgrounds. Uh, we have uh, two or three people reciting Quran, a uh, short part of the Quran. And then we we'll start discussing it, you see. Of course, myself and my brothers, we were very young. And we used to sit just to listen. And you could listen to the comment of uh, religious scholars, Arabic specialists, uh, medical doctors, engineers, lawyers. Uh, you, you could see different uh, views uh, commenting on a verse or uh, a few verses of the Quran. So uh, these uh, uh, sittings, gave us more education than the whole system of education we passed through. Then my father was uh, transferred to Cairo, and uh, the family moved with him to Cairo. I went to school in Cairo at the uh, age of seven or eight. This period was the phase of the uh, preparation of the Second World War. And of course, Cairo was uh, caught in the trap of fighting both the Germans and the Britishers. The Britishers were there occupying the country, and the Germans were trying to combat the uh, British troops in Egypt. And British troops were uh, grebutting the uh, German airplanes every night. We used to hear these whistles to dark out the houses and all night going out. And, and you could imagine how difficult this phase was uh, for a, a young boy of uh, eight to, to nine years, you see. Um, I got the primary education certificate in 1945, and then moved to the secondary school or the high school. And uh, during this phase, uh, the problem of Palestinian cropped out on the scene. And uh, the Britishers have moved out of Palestine, uh, or were pre preparing to move out of Palestine, handling the country mainly to the Jews, uh, a foreign body that has no right to be in the region at all, uh, ethnically or linguistically or religiously or uh, by any means. They were uh, people brought over to the region under the slogan uh, or the wrong slogan that they, they used to belong to people that lived in the region thousands of years ago. And actually this was a plot planned by the Britishers and the French in revenge for the defeat of the Crusaders in the Crusade War. So uh, the, uh, the region was in a great turmoil. And uh, in 1948, uh, the Britishers withdrew completely from Palestine, handling everything to the Jews, uh, their military bases, their administrative offices, the land, most of the property of the country. So uh, the war started between the Palestinians and the Jews. And, of course, Muslims were eager to go and fight uh, those occupiers of the region. And I lived that phase, you see. And uh, we had the Grand Mufti of Palestine. He was a close friend of my father, and he used to come and visit us in Cairo. And he used to issue a magazine called uh, Al-Quds. On its uh, cover, Quds al urubati the uh, Jerusalem is uh, a trust in the necks of all Muslims, so you have to do your best to save it as uh, much as this instruction has come in the Quran. So I used to read about this problem at a very early age, and I was really, uh, uh, really, I was enthusiastic to go and do something to combat these foreigners who came and occupied the region illegally and against all the laws of the international laws, you see. And um, sadly enough, uh, 
the uh, Arabs were not prepared to handle this problem because of ignorance of the seriousness of the problem of the division which uh, were uh, dissipated in the region. So finally the problem uh, culminated in the creation of a foreign body in the region called the State of Israel. And we know that Israel or Jacob is one of the prophets of Allah, one of the messengers of Allah, whom we honor and respect enormously. But of course, uh, prophets are not inherited. They don't establish a country in their name or a village or a land or, a, or even a house. So the, the uh, simple idea to name the country after the name of a prophet was an illusion to the people, a way of deceiving the people that this is a religious act. So uh, this phase again was a very serious phase uh, in my life. I took it uh, to the heart and I, uh, I was disappointed that I couldn't do much. Viewers, brothers and sisters, welcome back to the show. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi. Early years of his life, and he was at the point where he was studying at the University of Egypt, Cairo. So, Sheikh, I would like you to continue from there, please, if you wouldn't mind. I said in 1951, I went to Cairo University, and I was really um, surprised to find that the secular movement that was uh, imposed by the occupying forces in Egypt gave uh, fruits and many of the professors, many of the students and many of the administrators have actually become either secular or uh, uh, communists or uh, uh, socialists. Or they just wanted to drive people away from Islam as much as they could regardless of the direction they will go to. At that time, in 1951, uh, a student movement against uh, the British occupying forces that uh, were moved from Cairo to the Suez Canal Zone started and uh, the whole universities in Egypt changed into training centers uh, for these volunteers. And uh, some of my uh, colleagues at the university actually were uh, killed as martyrs in the battlefield. Uh, some of them were arrested by the British troops and they were tortured in their prisons. And we had really a, a very hard time in the very first few months in Cairo University. And uh, I continued on my studies until I graduated in 19... at the top of the graduates in my field, geology. Uh, but sadly enough, uh, I, I was arrested uh, by the government. I was sent to, the, to a military prison uh, where I stayed there for several months. I got out from uh, this military prison with the objection of the government against me to work anywhere. Not in the government, not in oil companies, not in mining companies, not anywhere. Finally, uh, I got a job with the National Research Institute. Uh, I stayed there for a few months and the government objection forced me out. I went to work for a phosphate company, phosphate mining company in the Nile Valley. I was there for uh, almost one year, and then I raised the case against the government, and I was called by the Supreme Court in Egypt. They told me that your arrest was by the decree from the president, and the president cannot be tried, so we'll help you to go back to university uh, on the condition that you can withdraw your case against the government. So they sent me to uh, Ain Shams University, where I worked for a year, again registered for a master's degree, and then I was forced to leave the university again. Uh, so there was no choice in front of me about to go back to companies, or mining companies. I worked for a gold mining company for a year in the eastern desert of Egypt, then moved to uh, a coal project in Sinai for uh, a few months, and then I moved to Saudi University. King Abdulaziz University in Riyadh. And after two years, I went to Britain to finish my PhD. I finished my PhD in 1963, and uh, I had uh, a postdoctorate research fellowship where I worked uh, for one year. And in uh, 1964, I came back to Saudi Arabia. I taught for uh, three years. 
and then uh, from there uh, a new university was established in Kuwait and I was called to work for that new university. I went to Kuwait in 1967 and uh, I remained there until uh, 1976. Uh, then I had a sabbatical leave where I went to the United States uh, University of California at Los Angeles. I have been there for a year and then I came back uh, to Kuwait. From Kuwait I moved to Qatar where a new university also was established and I headed the Department of Geology there. From Qatar I came back to Saudi Arabia, King Fahd University of Petroleum and Minerals where I stayed for uh, almost 20 years. And then I retired from there, went to Britain, headed uh, what was called the Mark Field Institute of Higher Education in uh, Britain, uh, north of London, near Leicester. I stayed there for one year and finally I came back to Egypt. Allah, Sheikh. <laughs> a long journey. Very long, very long. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. It seems like you have been through a lot. Mashallah, with a lot of uh, memorable moments. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. The question I'd like to ask you. The Prophet Sallallahu said, after hardship comes ease. So what is the most, you know, the, one of the hardest moments that you have faced in your years of giving dawah? Now, Allah, I, after I finished my uh, PhD, I was given this postdoctorate research fellowship. And then uh, a part of this fellowship was to go all over Western Europe, uh, studying what we call the type section of the different geologic ages and geologic periods. And these are scattered all over Western Europe because Allah has given me the insight to develop a new technique by which we can age these rocks by means of the remains of life in them. So I went uh, to uh, Denmark uh, uh, in the north, uh, up until Italy in the south, and Sweden, of course, at Stockholm. I went to Sweden, Denmark, France, Germany, uh, Belgium. Uh, I, then I went to Italy in the south, and Spain. Uh, in Spain, uh, I was received in the University of Barcelona uh, by a very great welcome. And uh, I recall this is... Uh, a missionary school, uh, actually, as a, a Christian university, mainly. Uh, and despite that, they received me with broad arms, and uh, I gave a series of lectures there. And they had a problem in, with their research, which Allah helped me solve it to them. And I recall the professor there, the chairman of the department, who used to be a priest, I stood up and said, Monsieur, vous êtes tombé du ciel. Uh, you have come to us from the sky, you see. Was it tombé de ciel? Well, I repeated it three times. Uh, Monsieur, was it tombé de ciel? And uh, at that night, uh, but I couldn't sleep. I just went to the shore of the sea, a promenade, and I just started walking. And uh, immediately I realized that uh, Egypt is on the other side of the sea, and uh, I cannot go there because of political reasons. I was very upset at that night, but uh, when I went to bed, um, I saw one of my students who became later on Minister of Information in Saudi Arabia uh, speaking to me and in, a, in a condoling language, uh, telling me that my father has passed away. And uh, I got up in the morning, really. I tried to contact uh, Cairo, contact my family. Uh, they told me that everything is okay. Uh, your father is only in hospital and he's improving, he's getting well. But uh, I came later to, to realize that he died the same night, exactly the same night. This was again one of the uh, things that cannot leave my memory. I can't, can't forget it at all, really, this particular night. Um, I would like to ask, what do you find? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you the ability to write so many books. MashaAllah, you have a lot of knowledge. May Allah bless you in this life and in the next. What do you think is your greatest achievement? Finally, before we end this show, what do you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed you, the greatest achievement? You see, uh, of course, science is a great uh, endeavor. Uh, I would encourage uh, many Muslims, if they have, who can view us really or see us today, uh, those who have any scientific inclinations to go into that area because uh, the Muslim world needs a great number of good scientists. 
and science is very much needed uh, to, to develop every Muslim scientist to bridge the gap which uh, has happened between religion and science. And because of this, I'm devoting most of my time these days to work on scientific notions in the glorious Quran. And by the grace of Allah, I have written almost uh, 65, 70 books along this line. I have an encyclopedia on the, the scientific miraculous aspects in the Quran that came in 10 volumes. And uh, I have also as, uh, another encyclopedia on uh, exegesis of the scientific notion in the Quran that came in four volumes. And as an introduction to these four volumes, I made a complete exegesis of the Quran in one volume. And I have written on scientific notions in the Sunnah that came out in three uh, booklets in Arabic and in English. And these were compiled in one volume in Arabic, one volume in English. I have written a large number of smaller books that have been translated into many languages to be pieces of da'wah in the only language that can be understood by people of our time, which is the scientific language. Dear viewers, brothers and sisters, I'm afraid we're out of time for this episode. I hope you have benefited greatly from what the Sheikh has had to say, from his life experiences and his stories. I know I have, and I hope you have. Join us again for the next episode. Alhamdulillah. Salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Spread the word, oh man. Spread the word of Islam. Oh, fortune one. Paradise must be one. Paradise must be one. Each day. Darkness and through light, cry it out to the world. Spread the word. Spread.